We are from Tigerland, the Bangladesh Tigers, that is. This is The Final Word with Jeff Lemon and Adam Collins, a cricket podcast on which we talk about cricket, uh, primarily first up Bangladesh, 4-1 over Australia, nearly had the whitewash, but Australia is invincible in the fourth rubber of T20 International Series. That <laughs> is where they flourish. That is where they are Vikings. Uh, also on the show today, we're talking to Jeff Allardyce, the boss of the ICC, about cricket going to the Olympics. It, it's going Great. to happen if it gets let in. Like they're actually committed to attempting to make this happen now. That is happening. And also, later on the show today, I'm talking to John Doyle, who some of you may know better as Rampaging Roy Slavin. Uh, I had a chat to John a week or two ago about his new book, and it wasn't specifically a final word interview, but it was a really interesting interview, and a, a, he's a great conversationalist. And so we thought people who listen to this show would enjoy that. Uh, the book is heavily about cricket in a whole lot of ways and uh, so why not get that involved as well so uh, bits and pieces all over the place we're looking at england india and that test series as well the test that didn't finish at nottingham and uh, i think that's about it on the show today aside from some nerd pledge and other bits and pieces nice long intro jeff i like it yeah the uh I've interviewed a number of Bangladesh cricketers over the years and obviously done a lot of press conferences with them. And I always try and get a question in there about their chronic mistreatment by Australian mm-hmm. administrators over generations. And they're always too classy to swing at the pitch. Like they always kind of give an answer that's fairly diplomatic, knowing that in the longer term, they want to have a better relationship with with, uh, with Australian yeah. administrators, I suppose. And, they, and they, they, you know, they don't rise to it. Privately, however, um, players have acknowledged to me in the past that they do get especially fired up when playing Australia and mm. they stuck it right up. I'm not this particular group. I'm at no reflection on this group of Australian players who I'm sure, you know, did the best they could. And we'll talk about the structural failings, I suppose, of Australia's T20 setup in a moment. But um, it, it feels good from a Bangladesh perspective that they get mm-hmm. their opportunity against Australia as infrequently as they come and they take full advantage, just as they did at Dhaka in that first test in 2017. Uh, they were able to thrash Australia. Australia and, and that's mm-hmm. a, a, another pointer towards uh, why they should have been treated better um, by Australian administrators over their 22-year journey as a full member nation of the ICC. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, well, if we have a, a little scan through what happened in that series, Australia bowled out for 108, 7 for 121, 4 for 117, 7 for 105, that's the one they won, uh, and bowled out for 62. Uh, that after losing 4-1 in the Caribbean only you know days before this this series began um all of the the reasons we've heard about the top line players missing the difficulty of getting yourself together in COVID times and bubbles and isolation and all the rest of it but it's a pretty thorough thrashing across the board for what's supposed to be the second rank of australian players we've heard a lot about bench depth over the last year or so, particularly with what yep. India managed to do when they were in Australia, and also the fact that England managed to turn out an entire reserve um, one-day international side, which beat Pakistan in a series there. Australia's bench depth doesn't look so hot. Yeah, not much to speak of, is it? And it's a World Cup year. Remember, they were building to a World Cup that was meant to be last October. Yeah, sure, yep. that was going to be at home, uh, different circumstances. Yes, there are players missing... Yes, we're at the end of a long run of, of bubbles and, and so mm. on that a number of those players have been involved in. Uh, so there are mitigating factors, but as Dan Bredig has written in a sort of comprehensive piece uh, for the newspaper today, um, this really is part of a two-year decline. Um, it's hard to point to many positives in the last mm. couple of years with the exception of one-day international cricket, which isn't really on Broadway for the majority of uh, full member nations, because, mm. oh, despite the fact that it is the, the one-day Super League now. It's not, you know, they're in T20 mode principally. If you're focusing on one format or the other, it tends to be T20. So it's not at all surprising that they would have done better in one day cricket, given there's been this malaise taking place. So yeah, captains nearing the end of their run in in Aaron Finch and Tim Payne. Mm -hmm. Not the complete end, but, you know, closer to the end and the start in both cases uh, in terms of white ball, red ball. Um, You know, the shift in emphasis from the Centre of Excellence in Australia A Tours more to a state-based programme, I mean, players being batted out of position, the way that even using as a test case Matthew Mm. Wade going from batting in the middle order because he was going to specialise there for the World Cup and then he's at the top of the order by the end. Of course, yeah. Dan Christian got thrown around from, from middle to the top as well. Mitchell Marsh, who perhaps could have a claim to be Australia's best finisher at the Scorchers, mm-hmm. 
now he's just another contender for a top three berth. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? Sure, it's a good thing that Mitchell Marsh is making runs and contributed, but it doesn't necessarily mm. solve any problems with the big tournament uh, they've got in the UAE in a couple of months. Their first World Cup in this format for five years, and they still, frankly, are a long way from having it right, even when you consider mm. where their frontliners might fit, even when you consider where a player like Marnus Labuschagne might fit into the mix, as talented as he is. But yeah, this is, um, this is a, a pretty rough way to end what's been a fairly brutal tour all told especially in T20 cricket and, and I think Marnus is uh, an indicator of the kind of backwards way that Australia looks at the way they select cricket teams which is that you know Marnus is uh, currently on the favourites list therefore has to be in contention for a T20 World Cup spot despite having done very little in the format uh, to speak of and then look as as to who's coming in next yeah as you say there's where Australia lacks is, is a five, a six, a seven. You know, that's where they're not sure about who should go there. They don't need another three. If you've got Warner, Finch, Smith, Maxwell, there's your top four mm. sorted, none of whom were playing. I thought it was very interesting that these squads, you know, with with the absences, with Finch going home injured, there were no specialist batters in the squad by the end of that Bangladesh tour. It was a lineup made up entirely of wicket keepers and all rounders who had to do their best um, with the situation they were in. Uh, popping down Christian up to open in one game, look, that made sense to me. That's It's it's the kind of um, approach that Aaron Finch took in 2016. You might remember this, the, the white ball, the, the 50 over and 20 over series in Sri Lanka where they were playing on a lot of very turning surfaces and basically Finch figured that the easiest time to score was against the new ball. And so he just went as hard as possible off the top. You know, he, he might be making 50 off 20 balls off the top. The team would be then grinding their way to 220, 230, 240. But because it was so hard to score later, um, he decided to take advantage of conditions at the beginning. So I think that's what they were trying to do with Dan Christian. He got out cheaply. That can happen in a T20. He only had one shot at it. You know, I didn't think that was necessarily mm. a bad move. But with Wade being a captain, he wants to open. That, You know, honestly, when he was captaining, he captained that one-off game in Australia over the summer. He immediately popped himself back up to open because that was his prerogative as a captain. That's where he's done his best work as a T20 player. So he's tried to do the middle order thing as the team thing, but he doesn't really want to bat there. That's not where he feels like he does his best work. Yeah, it's interesting stepping back from this and thinking about the five-year cycle that's been. I think in the lead-up to the 2016 World Cup, there was a sense that Australia don't play an awful lot of T20 international cricket. Often it's one game or two games mm. tacked on the back of a one-day tour. It's usually kind of the 50-over squad with maybe you know a, 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 a bow on top, like I remember Cameron Boyce played that one game, didn't he? For example, yeah. emblematic of emblematic <laughs> of um, you know a, a player or two uh-huh. maybe getting drafted in. But it was principally the one-day squad with a couple of tweaks, and that was a pretty fair critique. And they never really looked like they were going to progress in that competition. Mm. I think from memory, they were bundled out in, in the group stage, maybe the quarterfinals, whatever it was, they, they didn't look like they were ever really going to threaten the big couple of teams. So, and we look forward to now. I actually don't think it's the same anymore. I reckon they have prioritized a lot of T20 international cricket mm. in this cycle, especially when they thought the World Cup was going to be in Australia. A number of tri-series that they've played around the world, they've always balanced out their one days with T20s. So it's a different kind of problem now yeah. in that, uh, they've played so much cricket in this form, a far more mature domestic T20 cop than they would have had five years ago as well. Um, yet there's still these sort of structural shortcomings where in other parts of the world, they've got very specialised T20 teams. And again, this mm. is a point that Dan Breddick makes in his piece in The Age. Um, but this Australian team seems to suffer from not having those specialist positions sewn up at this pointy end of the cycle. Remember when England were hosting mm. the World Cup in 50 over cricket uh, in 2019? They had their lineup really very well set, 18, 12 to 18 months before the World Cup. There was enough room to mm. make an addition like Jofra Archer, uh, but they weren't making structural changes to their top six, top seven. Uh, yeah. And that's effectively what Australia is going to have to do now. And, and you could say, and I heard Matthew Wade kind of suggest that, well, look, the, the pitches in Bangladesh uh, won't be that similar to what they get in the UAE. That might be the case in the first week of the tournament. But as we get deeper and deeper, playing on the same grounds every single day, lots of cricket, they will have wear and tear. They mm. will spin a lot. They, they, it'll be like 2016 where low scores will 
occasionally prevails. So yeah. um, unless unless you're playing at Sharjah, I suppose, with the short boundaries, I'd imagine that Dubai and Abu Dhabi won't be a million miles away from what Duck has been in I, the last week as we get into the tournament. I don't think they'll be as extreme um, in that mm. we've seen a couple of IPL editions get staged in the UAE. We've seen qualifying tournaments and so on where there's heavy traffic on a limited number of strips and the ground staff at those grounds are good enough at getting, getting a pitch usable. So... Yeah, sure. They, that's true. Yeah, they they will be slower, but I mean, I I think, and a bit like what we saw in twenty sixteen was that on some grounds a one twenty to one thirty score was possibly defendable. I mean, in Bangladesh, a ninety to a hundred score was defendable over the series that we've just seen. So I I think it's a more extreme version, and maybe that's more where he's where he's getting at, um, saying that it's not going to be that bad. But I mean. I wonder whether Matthew Wade's batted himself out of a spot in that squad. I, I wonder whether Moe Enriquez has as well. And, and I hate to say that because, you know, he's a, a player I have a lot of affection for, but he's he's had a lot of opportunities now. He's been in the side over these last 10 matches. He's had chance after chance to stamp an impression on a game, and he hasn't really done it. Um, Dan Christian's done it a little bit from a, he, a couple of opportunities and he is playing that higher risk sort of role and he has come off twice in the last 10 games and maybe that's enough for your, your sort of late innings finisher to, yep. to come off that often. But that that next rank down, you know, I, I just wonder if some of those players have played themselves out of a spot over the last couple of series. Yeah, well, I think it speaks to the fact that I don't know what they're doing exactly, that it would be difficult to name what Australia's top seven would be for that first World Cup game. You can mm. take a stab, but I don't think you could say it with any true authority. There, there are a lot of questions to answer. And look, maybe they'll fit in another um, T20 tour. This was a question that was doing the rounds a couple of days ago. Will yeah. Australia find time for another warm-up before they go to the UAE? And maybe they will. Uh, and maybe they will. And maybe they'll get it right. The best team will be there and, and they'll and they'll find form at the right time as they did before the 2019-50 over World Cup, which really came together late. So, mm. you know, time isn't on their side necessarily, but we're not completely, you know, it's not the eve of the tournament either. Yeah. Uh, and big names do come back, sure. Uh, but but nevertheless, there, there does feel as though it's it's five minutes to midnight. And this Australian team, as someone joked uh, on Twitter to me, Andrew54, uh, Andrew Lowcock, one of our subscribers actually, uh, when we were talking about the Olympic Games on Twitter earlier today, and we'll, we'll go into this in a bit more depth with Jeff Allardyce in a sec, but um, there'll be eight teams qualifying for the men's tournament and women's mm. tournament at the 2028 Olympics, provided it goes the way the ICC are pitching. And he said, well, at least the men's team won't have to worry about going over there. They may not be in the top <laughs> eight T20 teams in the world. And uh, the fact that it's funny, this is, I suppose, is a kernel of truth to that. Mm. Well, it, but it's also been a long-standing thing. You know, Australia has comparatively, like, relatively, relative to its strengths um, and its financial health and all the rest of it, has underperformed in T20 cricket forever. They made the T20 World Cup final in 2010, was it, against England? Yep. And, you know, that was about as close as they got. I think it was the 2014 tournament when... Because, you know, you were talking about specialised... Uh, players for roles they tried that they tried that in 14 they basically picked the Big Bash All-Stars team to go and play with the players who had been performing in that format you know Brad Hogg and Brad Hodge and so on that didn't work you know that fell flat their 2016 team fell flat so when they've gone with the sort of test and 50 over players who are the cream of the crop players it hasn't worked when they've gone with the T20 specialists it hasn't worked I don't think anyone can put a finger on why that hasn't worked over the long term. So I think it's it's pretty easy to get into the uh, stuck into the current administration. But what what has happened previously over the you know the ten years before that after you know the first few years Australia clearly didn't take it seriously when Ricky Ponting was in charge. T Twenty cricket didn't matter. But after that, you know what's what's gone on in the last decade that they haven't really been able to put up a competitive team most of the time. Yeah, and especially, and coming back to this point, that they were building towards something special, potentially. Uh, mm. Or so they thought, anyway, winning the winning the World Cup uh, for the first time in this format. And of course, that's gone away, and maybe they'll get that chance next year, but they look a million miles off the pace uh, at mm. the moment. Um, yeah, I, I suppose the other question is, where will this Bangladesh tour sit? I mean, they've been thrashed 4-1. It's a mm -hmm. comprehensive defeat. Um, yeah. It wasn't on television. It was off Broadway. Um, you can already see, you know, down the track, if Australia, I mean, we, we joked about this the other week, if Australia win the Ashes 5-0, and look, they probably will. Um, or, or, you know, they probably will win the Ashes heavily anyway. I, I, I don't see a scenario where England's batting um, holds up for, through enough test cricket to, to seriously contend in in that series. Um, 
We'll lay this reflexively, um, control mm. C, control V, and, and, and you know renew contracts left, right, and centre. Probably, uh, because when you yeah. boil it down, what does Australian cricket care about? It cares, it cares about winning the Ashes, perhaps a lot more um, than, than, uh, than it does in, in the shortest form. And a lot of people would be fine with that, and I respect that point of view. But it doesn't mean that building into a World Cup, that it doesn't require scrutiny, even with all the caveats we've, we've outlined about player availability and the, and the difference in conditions mm. in Bangladesh to what they're used to in T20 cricket around the world. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you actually whether you think that a, a series loss like this, is this the sort of series loss that only sports writers care about? You know, the, it's the sort of um, the, 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 the Bretting Cherney measurement. Uh, Dan Bretting and Daniel Cherney are annoyed about it, but is anyone else? Like, has anyone noticed? Um, it, has, it hasn't been screened. Oh, no one's been able I, to see I, yeah. it. I see the point. I, look, I, t- I take your point that it is It is because of the lack of visibility, mm. there's perhaps a lack of... But I tell you what, I mean, when Australia were getting bowled out for 62 yesterday, plenty of people knew about it. Mm. Um, this is an unusual thing to happen in T20 cricket full stop, but even more unusual to happen to the national team in the lead-up to a World Cup. Even more unusual to happen against Bangladesh, a country who Australia don't play an awful lot against, even in those sorts of conditions. So, it, look, if Australia had have won 3-2 or 4-1 and it had have been a fairly uh, unremarkable series, uh, then maybe that would be the case. But, no, I, I do think this has a bit of currency. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, putting to one side all, all the broadcast politics of whether it should have been on somewhere. And I think when we left it last week, there was a suggestion that it was going to be on YouTube. But, um, of course, that was never going to be the case. Why was um, the Bangladesh Cricket Board and their, and their subsidiaries going to allow this to be on TV for free on YouTube? Uh, you know, that, that made no sense whatsoever. I don't know how that story got written um, mm. to begin with. But, um, yeah, so, yes, it's middle of footy season. Yes, the Olympics were on uh, and all of these other points. But, yeah, I reckon people won't forget uh, that the Australian team at this particular juncture got done 4-1 by Bangladesh and, you know, a word for the Bangladeshis as well. They didn't make loads of runs. Um, mm. The Australian bowlers did a good job. I mean, Nathan Ellis's hat trick on debut uh, stands out, but across the board, they kept Bangladesh to fairly modest tallies. It was their exceptional spin bowling group uh, who, at home, are so difficult to play, especially, mm. uh, and who honed their skills at that ground, that, that practice facility out the back there at the National Stadium, night after night after night, and deep into the evening. Uh, they continue to work as hard as they can, and, and they got the rewards here. Yeah, aside from the five balls when Dan Christian popped Shakib over the fence five <laughs> times in, in and over, um, which was it, it, pretty much the one bit of vision from the series that I did get to watch, um, which was, it, it was an enjoyable <laughs> time, I will I will say that. It, it has been nice seeing uh, the other DC get uh, some, some late <laughs> rewards. He, you know, it, I hope he gets to go on to the T20 World Cup. I think he will because I think they'll, I think they'll look at him as that seven. You know, he's, that's, that's the spot that's been hardest for Australia to find someone for and he's the kind of player who might be able to pull that off and who's played enough IPL to, to slot right in there but um, yeah the Olympics look, even even a curmudgeon like me had to admit that the Olympics were pretty good um, I was amazed that it, that we got through it like I just I thought it would be coveted off two days in it, it's a miracle that they got through it but having done it it was you know it made you feel pretty good watching the Olympics but um it would it would make you feel better if there were cricket in there, wouldn't it? Yeah, I'm kind of lost without it at the moment. Look, I love the Olympics. I'm an Olympophile, you know, will be forever. And, and I get that, you know, not everyone feels that way about the Olympic Games these days, and that's fine. But it's kind of my my jam, and I've I've had a great time over the last two and a half weeks. And sad that it's over, but yeah, sort of thrilled that the conversation has been picked up in our little corner of the world. 